All right, so uh, you know the drill. So let's start with our friend Rick. Please stand and fill the room with your wonderfulness. Uh, good morning, Justin. Rick Doherty with uh, Envisioneering here. And uh, you may have to get one of those EKG paddle kits for the cat. <laughs> okay. um, I was really pleased that you delivered on Radio Free Intel from 10 years ago. And uh, of course, the Atom die is small to begin with, but you were at about two and a half times the size of the Atom CPU. What are your aspirations for those communication circuits uh, in the future as to how they might be uh, more efficient and ratio-metric? Right. Um, well, I think the, you know, the, the radio that we, that we used in, uh, in Rose Point was, a, was an earlier iteration. So we were sort of moving, we were moving down parallel tracks. And, and we've done a lot of work with, uh, you know, with Intel's um, process technologists to make sure that um, you know, we had the, the right set of features, uh, particularly high resistivity substrates and things like that. So that's, that's a, an earlier radio that didn't, sort of didn't have the, the full digital treatment. So, um, you know, so going forward, uh, we'll run another experiment where, where we'll you know, bring the radio in, and obviously the, the size of the radio will continue, uh, continue to shrink. So, um, you know, we're, uh, you know, I think we're reasonably confident at this point that, you know, the radio will be a relatively small part of, you know, the typical, um, typical SOC die, and, um, and that we can, um, um, you know, um, Manage the the interference between the, you know between the two radios. I mean, you think about uh, you know an atom running at 1.2 gigahertz and you know and the, and the Wi-Fi radio is running at 2.4. You know <laughs> the major harmonic is sitting right there. We um, we actually um, uh, we actually can do active interferer cancellation and we and we had the demo. We cut it for time. So um, you just change um, some of the factors in the, in the fractional end synthesizer, and it and it moves the interferer out of the you know of the radio spectrum. So if that interferer was a you know was like a processor clock or something like that, we we can manage that digitally in the in the radio. So there's there's a lot more a lot more going on than we were able to to share this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Justin. Number three, Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie Emergency Maker. I think you know that. Um, Intel has been sometimes accused of borrowing IP from other firms. And I just wanted to point out that I was first at IEF with the Pink Bunny Ears. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> I think there are photos on the Intel.com newsroom of that. So okay. If you want to have that horror film. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Uh, let's go with Dave over there. Number By the way, I've, I've tried to practice getting the ears to actually respond to the way I'm thinking. <laughs> no, luck, no luck so far. Uh, David Cantor, Real World Tech. Yeah. So you're uh, talking about digitizing you know, vast swaths of analog circuitry. Um, when you look at the digital equivalent of your analog circuit, uh, is there an impact in terms of power and area? Uh, an overhead, that is to say. Because certainly you're getting process portability, but there's some cost associated with that, I would assume. Yeah, I think Yorgos, um, I think Yorgos said that um, the, um, you know, the, the experimental um, radio, the, you know, the Moore's Law radio, uh, was about, you know, comparable um, to the, you know, sort of best of class Wi-Fi radios of the, um, uh, of the day. Um, now, you know, that said, um, you know, it, it, we were, you know, our focus was on getting it to work, not on getting it to minimum power. So um, there's clearly much more, uh, much more opportunity to, to do that. And I'm, and I'm speaking of that independent of the scaling opportunities that will come, and that will, and that will further drive, uh, drive power down. Uh, more generally speaking, um, you know, the digital radios just have an amazing amount of control. I mean, one of the things, another thing we just didn't have time to do. Is um, is talk about self calibration? It was it was unfortunate because, you know, we had talked about how you struggle with analog radios. You know, many passes through the fabs. You know, tweaking you know critical analog elements. Um, you know, we can do calibration in real time. 
So you know, if we, you know, if the if the system detects drift, it can actually correct for that, you know, by just changing, you know, a few parameters in the registers. So um, you know, you you and and I talked about the the interferer example. So you 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 really come to appreciate all the additional versatility you have when you when you've got a digital design. It's just it's it's you know it's it's more powerful. Um, than uh, than simply replacing the analog equivalent. You, it is a much better radio, and I think it makes for a much better product radio because of that that control. Thank you. So the mic number one. Uh, Jack Clark says, Dnet. How does um, stability, noise sensitivity, and output purity compare with analog radio? And how do you expect it to work with SDR architectures? Well, I, you know, the the baseband is already, um, you know, it's already digitized. So, um, you know, I mean, it won't have it won't have any problem. I think when you're operating. I mean, if it, you know, if it doesn't drive an atom processor crazy, I'm not worried about the the baseband. But the, um, uh, but I, you know, I mentioned this uh, somewhat raucous debate at Intel um, over. The feasibility of that digital synthesizer. I mean, I had senior managers at, at Intel saying, you know, digital synthesizers are the future of radio design and always will be. Uh, I mean, they simply did not believe that you can build um, a competitive digital uh, frequency synthesizer, particularly a frac M synthesizer. Um, you know, here again, this gets back to the other question. Um, uh, you know, we do. You know, we do active cancellation of the of the spurs, and we have a demo. We didn't show it today. We have a demo, and and um, as soon as you turn it on, um, you know, there's a 60, 60, 60 dB reduction in spur amplitude. I mean, it's really stunning. Uh, and so, um, you know, we have the we have the spectral purity, uh, both for Wi-Fi and for um, you know and for cellular. So here again, you know, the ability to on the fly dial everything in, so you know, you get maximum cancellation of the spurs. I mean, really, really does make for a better radio. And again, you know, a better radio, not just in production. I'm not just talking about the yield at the you know at the end of the fab, but in the field, we believe these radios will will outperform the best of the analog radios because they're constantly in calibration and they're actively dealing with the interference environment. Thank you. Let's go with Nathan, number three. Then we'll go to Paul. I think you had a question. Yeah, thanks. I want to echo Rick's comment about having the persistence to go on this radio free cake for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right. Uh, but my question relates to the CRAM base station uh, processing. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're doing in those servers. But I'm wondering whether you really need the kind of computational horsepower that a Core i7 or a Xeon has. Could you, in fact, use microservers to handle that kind of task? Well, yeah, I, and I think um, uh, I think you heard um, you know Sunny make the comment about you know running a large number of base stations on a, on a you know on a single server, you know hundreds and probably in a few years even thousands of, of base stations on. A, um, on a server, so um, you know we in, in, a, in a cloud round you wind up with um, you know with basically just just the RF section in the tower, uh, you know from the A to D's, you know on you packetize it. There, by the way, there are even standardized packet formats for for doing it. I mean, you can use. Ethernet, but the comms guys, true to form, have their, have their own packet format. So, you know, if you own the fiber optic backhaul, you can run one of these um, these communication uh, standards. And you know, and and you know, from the ADD on, it's you know, it's software defined radio. And of course, you're you know, you're implementing the the rest of the LTE stack um, or um, you know, whatever whatever it is. So you completely, you know, I mean, literally. Eliminate all but the you know the the, the front end of the of the RF um, at the at the tower and um, you know the potential is 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 there to really go beyond um, you know sort of the 
in, you know, original Bell Labs notion of, of what is a cellular network, um, you know, the, the formal notion of a handoff can be potentially eliminated. Once you have all of the digitized antenna signals coming into the data center, um, you have the possibility of running a very large MIMO um, uh, algorithm. So, you know, you think of a, you know, of a client radio moving through this forest of antennas and you run the computation that, that allows you to take the, the contributions of all those antennas and, and add them up. Um, but the first thing is to get all the signals into the data center and then all sorts of new opportunities open up there. So you're saying basically it is a pretty serious you just, you computational get a problem. problem. You're saying it is a pretty serious computational problem. Well, yeah, and, and by the way, it was, it was not easy, um, uh, and we may have mentioned it last year, I mean, just getting the, the single LTE stack running um, um, in real time, right, uh, was, a, was a challenge. And, um, you know, there was, there's, some, there's some really uh, carefully coded <laughs> sections of, you know, down in, the, down in the stack so, you know, so you can run it in real time. And, and faster processors just um, give you the opportunity to run more towers. It would sound like there may be some special kind of processing units you could add to future CPUs to speed. Uh, yeah, and in fact, I think um, you know if, if you talk to the, the folks in the, um, in the communication infrastructure group, I think they may have a slightly different name now at Intel. Um, you know, they they have early um, you know early versions. I don't know if they have an LTE version, but they certainly have a 3G version where they actually have some custom silica. I can't remember what ZPGA or something. They have some part. It's doing the low-level work. Our goal is not to have any specialized stuff. Um, you know, the vector engines, you know, AVX2, AVX3, that, you know, that kind of stuff is just what you need to run the algorithms. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. All right, Paul, and then we'll wrap it up with number one. Uh, Paul Moody, Into Network. Justin, do you have any idea what kind of Intel processors are currently live on Mars? <laughs> I don't. I know, that's not my department. I'm not worrying about the deep space mission of our processors. I don't know. But Jay, any, any idea what's running on Mars? Okay, yeah. Do you know? <laughs> no, I don't either. So we do know that Will I Am is broadcasting from Mars. That we do know. But is he? Not, but is he doing it with an Intel processor? We don't know. I believe he is. He probably says that in his contract. Our director of Creative Innovation, absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's wrap it up at number one, please. So Jennifer Scott, Thank Computer you. Weekly. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi. Um, talking again about the cloud rants, I'm wondering, obviously you've been speaking about all the work you've been doing in China. Have you been working with any European partners at all? And in the UK, for example, where we're about to embark on a 4G rollout, is there any discussions going there, or would that be something you'd look to do? Well, uh, and the conversations, um, We've had, um, you know, you know, globally. Uh, I, I'm sure include, you know, conversations in the in the UK. You know, our focus is more on the, you know, the network uh, suppliers, and uh, as opposed to the carriers. Um, uh, although it helps to have the carriers pulling, and I think that's why the relationship with China Mobile Research, um, and you know, and, and through them to, you know, China Mobile is so valuable. Because it, as you say, you know, you get an internal advocate with the carrier that you know that then comes back to the vendors and, and provides the pull for the technology. Um, you know, just my my personal sense, I haven't you know I haven't been in all these visits, but the visits I've had with the European um, uh, vendors, uh, and I won't name any names, uh, they've been relatively cool uh, to the idea. Obviously, they have a lot of uh, you know investment. Uh, and uh, you know, and, and since you know, since you're turning radio access networks from what was largely a hardware business to what will be primarily a software business, you can understand why they're why they're relatively cool about. Again, China Mobile and, and through China Mobile Research Institute uh, is you know is a big help, and as um, you know, as standards. Um, uh, are you know are defined and there are groups within 3GPP that are that are active here. Um, you know I think we'll we'll continue to grow interest in uh, in Europe. But 
Um, you know, I would say for the moment, uh, the reception amongst the providers has been relative. The, the system supplier has been relatively cool. 